Okay, in my previous video, I demonstrated how you can uh, model um, if the uh, relationship between time and uh, scores on a repeated measurement uh, using HLM uh, in SPSS. So basically, we have uh, essentially uh, students' test scores with each student measured at time one, two, and three. Um, and um, so this is essentially our, you know, our repeated measure at level one, and then students are uh, our level two, um, you know, essentially our between subjects um, factor. So um, in that particular demonstration, though, we had a time variable and quad time both uh, tr incorporated as predictors of uh, variation in test scores. Um, so uh, again, what we were trying to do is to pick up on any kind of trend components um, over time when it came to uh, students' test scores. So uh, what we're going to do in this video, uh, I'm going to start us off by just uh, kind of going back and showing you what we did previously and then illustrating how we can allow, um, you know, our um, trend components to vary uh, across individuals. Because the basic idea behind growth curve modeling is that, um, you know, one fixed uh, uh, trend um, component may not necessarily work for, for everyone in our data set. And so it may be that students might vary in terms of, um, in terms of those components, whether it be linear or quadratic components. So in the previous video, we kind of walked through, we, you know, we moved our uh, subjects variable ID over to the subjects box. We moved our index variable over to the repeated box. We selected a scaled identity covariance type. And um, we had uh, test as our dependent variable and the covariates in the model included time and quad time. So under fixed, we had these two variables as well. Uh, we moved them over to the model box. And um, so, you know, in a nutshell, uh, when we ran our, our analysis, uh, what we ended up with are, you know, the fixed effects for, uh, we had the intercept, which as I mentioned in the previous video is the grand mean of the, um, you know, time one test scores across the students. We had time, which, is a fixed effect. So this is the linear component of our trend. And then we had quad time, which is capturing, uh, um, you know, the quadratic component of our trend. And we saw that, you know, that this trend, this uh, component was statistically significant, suggesting that, you know, indeed that there's, um, there's value in uh, modeling um, uh, uh, a quadratic trend um, in terms of the students uh, 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 growth trajectories. So, um, and just to kind of re-highlight what I'm, what I'm talking about, you know, um, in, in one of my earlier videos, I kind of demonstrated this using, um, you know, modeling the trends using the data. Uh, we had, uh, we took the first uh, 17 students, and when we, um, essentially, when we, um, you know, plotted out their growth trajectories, and this is what we had had previously, when we plotted out their growth trajectories, we saw We saw that um, you know these are you know these are this these are examples uh, assuming that uh, the growth trajectories are linear, and we saw variation in terms of the intercepts and slopes. That's assuming a linear trajectory. But then when we looked under quadratic trends, you know we saw that really uh, the you know assuming that kind of trend over time, uh, you know it seemed like that 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 kind of trending better fit. Uh, the individual students' gro growth trajectories. So the next uh, step after we've, you know, and so we basically have tested uh, our model um, in our previous video, and we found evidence that, you know, that, yeah, it looks like that maybe a quadratic um, trend component really makes more sense instead of treating uh, the growth curves as being uh, linear over time. So now what we want to do, though, is we see that the, the growth curves look like they're differing across individuals. And so what we want to do is to allow uh, for variation in the growth curves across individuals. Because right now, if we just stick with the fixed um, uh, effects in the model, we're assuming a common growth trajectory across the individuals. And we don't want to do that if, if the growth curves are looking you know, quite different. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset um, our um, uh, cases so that we have all cases in our analysis. And I'm going to rerun 
our, um, our uh, growth curve model, but in this case, allowing for there to be variation in uh, slopes for our uh, predictors. Now the deal is, is that you know we have two predictors in our model representing components of our growth trajectory. So we have time, which is essentially capturing sort of the linear component, and then we have quad time, which is kind of uh, capturing the uh, um, the quadratic component. And the basic idea being that you know the relationship between time and um, and test scores uh, itself is changing over time. So that's why the quad time variable is in here. Now the deal is is that if we if we um, are going to incorporate two predictors in this kind of way, uh, one of the things to keep in mind is is that the number of random effects at level two um, uh, is equal to, the the maximum number is equal to uh, the number of um, um, effects minus one. So basically, we have to estimate um, an effect for the intercept, and then we have to estimate either. A, ran, a random effect for a linear or quadratic term, but we can't uh, incorporate uh, both of them. So, um, so at any rate, what we're going to do is we are just going to focus in on allowing the uh, linear component to uh, vary uh, over time, and um, but we're going to fix uh, the effect of the quad time variable. So we're essentially, um, yeah, we're we're essentially assuming that this component is fixed across the individuals, whereas this component. Uh, ra varies randomly across individuals. So to do this, what we end up doing is we go to uh, the random button and we're going to move time over uh, to this box right here. Now, at this point, we now have uh, two random components. We have essentially the slope for time and we have this, the uh, intercept. They're allowed to randomly vary across uh, the individuals at level two. So in terms of the covariance type, we could stick with the scaled identity, which would mean that we're basically assuming that, uh, that uh, the variances for each of those, co the, those components are uh, equal. But we really don't want to do that. Um, and in fact, it may be that the, uh, the intercepts and the slopes might, uh, might co-vary. So what we're going to do, kind of sticking with the presentation in the Heck et al. book, is to allow uh, there to be a covariance between the randomly varying intercepts and slopes. So to do this, we're going to click on covariance type and go down to unstructured. And so when we do this, click on continue. Um, we're going to leave everything else exactly the way it was in the previous videos. Um, and now at this point, we're just going to click on OK. And so now what we see is we see uh, we, we get at level two, we have an unstructured uh, covariance type, and that is going to involve the estimation of three unique parameters. Basically, the variance in the intercept, variance in the slopes, and the covariance between the two. We still have the random effects set up as an identity, uh, scaled identity matrix, which means we're only estimating a common variance, uh, which means that we're only going to be estimating one parameter for that from that matrix. Um, in terms of the effects, we have the intercept, the grand mean um, across individuals. So that's essentially the time one, uh, the mean across uh, individuals at time one. Uh, we have uh, time, the, the regression coefficient, uh, the fixed effect uh, over individuals, as well as the quad time variable also having a fixed effect. So when we scroll down, you'll notice now we still have um, we still have our, um, our intercept and uh, our slopes for time and quad time. Uh, you can see that, uh, again, you know, basically um, our quad time uh, predictor was significant, suggesting that, yeah, quadratic trend probably fits the individual growth curves better than just the time trend. And then when we look at the estimates of covariance parameters, now you see we still have the variance estimate for the residuals at level one being statistically significant. We have the unstructured matrix. And so, you know, what that translates into is that we're estimating variance for the uh, intercepts, variance for the slopes for time, and then the covariance between the two. And that's just basically repeated above the uh, principal diagonal. So essentially, then, we have three parameters that are being estimated, and that's what we referred to earlier. So 1, 1 is basically the, this, the variance for the intercept. 
the 2, 2 is representing the variance for the slopes, and then the 2, 1 is essentially representing the covariance between the two. And so you can see that we have significant variation across the groups in terms of the intercepts. So theoretically, we could add in uh, person-level predictors of variation across uh, the individuals in terms of their intercepts. And we also have uh, the slopes varying across individuals as well. So we could theoretically add in a level two predictor uh, to account for varying uh, slopes um, um, reflecting uh, the, the variation in the, the linear uh, time component uh, across individuals. So at any rate, uh, that covers um, this particular example. Um, like I said, we were just basically allowing the, the uh, slopes to vary across groups. Uh, in a later video, we'll start talking about predictors of variation in those slopes.